In this video, we're going to look at the activity of condensed phases and see why things like the concentrations of solids and liquids are often left out during uh, the, core, the calculation of equilibrium constants. Okay, so we have a reaction here, which is going to serve as an example. We have solid iodine reacting with hydrogen gas, forming two moles of hydrogen iodide in the gas. So we can define a thermodynamic equilibrium constant for this reaction. We can have Ka equals um, activity squared of Hi, our product to the power of its stoichiometric coefficient, divided by our reactants, which are going to be activity of iodine times activity of H2, each of those with a coefficient of 1. So for gases, the activity is just defined as fugacity divided by standard fugacity, which is one bar. So if we use a unit of bar, we can just replace activity with fugacity for gases. So fugacity squared of hydrogen iodide divided by activity of iodine times fugacity of H2. But what exactly is this activity for the iodine solid? So that's something that we need to go ahead and define and see why it's going to be left out of most kinds of equilibrium constants. So what we need to do, as I said, need to define activity for solids and liquids where the standard state is one bar of pressure. Okay, <clears throat> so we're going to look at how the chemical potential of a substance changes with respect to pressure. So first of all, I'm going to define the chemical potential of a chemical substance as the standard chemical potential at a given temperature plus RT times the natural log of its activity. So this chemical potential is going to be a function then of temperature and pressure. And so if we have, um, let's remind ourselves that the chemical potential being just a Gibbs, uh, molar Gibbs energy, it's <clears throat> a partial derivative with respect to pressure at constant temperature is going to be the molar volume. So this is the fact that um, the Gibbs energy, the d partial derivative of Gibbs energy with respect to pressure is volume, and chemical potential is just molar Gibbs energy, so you get molar volume for that derivative. Okay, let's take the constant temperature um, change of the chemical potential here as well. So we're going to have d mu i equals at constant temperature, this is constant, so it doesn't change, plus R is constant, T is constant, uh, and the natural log of our activity can change. So we're going to get that is equal to RT <coughs> natural log, sorry, RT times change in our natural log of our activity coefficient. That's at constant T. Okay. And then we have um, d mu dp equals v bar. So if we have constant temperature, then our total derivative of mu, which is a function of temperature and pressure, is equal to v bar dp. Again, making the assumption that that is done at constant temperature. OK, so we can put these two together. And then what we're going to get is we have we have d mu i here, d mu i there. So we have v bar dp equals rt d log of activity. Okay, so solving both sides um, and separating variables, we have the change in the log of the activity coefficient is equal to v bar over RT, DP. 
Okay, and since we have these separated, now we're gonna integrate both sides to isolate the activity coefficient, or activity. We're gonna integrate, we're gonna integrate from the standard state, which we said we need to define as one bar of pressure. So this is gonna integrate from one up to P, whatever given pressure we're interested in. So I'm gonna go ahead and put a P prime here so that we integrate over a dummy variable instead of P. And the activity, the natural log of the activity at a standard pressure of one bar has to be zero because the chemical potential at standard state is the chemical potential at one bar. So mu i of one bar is mu i naught. So RT log A at one bar has to be zero. But neither R or T are zero. So log A has to be zero, which means A is one under A under a pressure of one bar. But we're integrating with respect to natural log of A and natural log of one is zero. Okay, so that's zero, and we're integrating from that up to natural log of whatever activity we end up getting up to. So I'll just go ahead and put a prime on there that we're integrating with respect to some dummy variable. All right, so we do these integrals then and substitute in the the other values we get that the natural log of the activity for our solids and liquids is equal to we have 1 over RT integral from 1 to P V bar DP prime so this is the molar volume of whatever condensed phase, meaning solid or liquid, uh, chemical substance we have. But uh, condensed phases are actually pretty resilient with respect to compression. Their volume doesn't change a lot with changing pressure unless you apply just a, a ton of pressure, a lot, a lot, a lot of pressure. So we're going to assume that the molar volume is approximately constant from 1 up to P. We're going to assume that the molar volume of our substance doesn't really change a lot with respect to pressure. And that's probably true unless this pressure is like thousands or millions of bar. Okay, so making that assumption, then we pull this out, the molar volume, and then integral of dP from 1 to P is just P minus 1. So what we end up getting there is that the natural log of the activity for our condensed phases is equal to molar volume times pressure minus one in terms of bar divided by gas constant times temperature. So this gives us a definition for what our activity is for condensed phases. I don't want to do that. That covers up the bar. So that gives us a definition for our activity of condensed phases. And as we can see from this, what we have is, in terms of this definition, as P approaches one bar, we have the very nice property. As P approaches one bar, we have the very nice property that the activity is going to approach one. Because if we have uh, one bar of pressure here, we have one minus one, this side becomes zero, natural log equals zero, so activity must be equal to one. So this is why this is generally not included in various equilibrium constants, is because the activity of something like a solid or a liquid is generally considered to be a constant, and it's generally considered to be a constant which is just one. So the activity of this iodine here in this reaction is gonna be one, and the activity of water in an aqueous reaction is generally just going to be assumed to be one. So that means that our equilibrium constant then is going to make the simplification that we are going to have our thermodynamic equilibrium constant for this reaction will just be fugacity squared of hydrogen iodide divided by fugacity of hydrogen. And we don't have to deal with the activity 
of our solid here, hydrogen iodide, our, our, our solid iodine here, because its activity is going to be constant, and it is going to be a constant, which is 1.